Hello everyone, my name is Mark. I've been working at the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation for about seven years now and three more as a student. We've got a very large country and uh, in a way it's kind of strange because we've got such a small population. And being such a young nation, there's lots of great differences in terms of contrast and change. So it used to be that we were very European in background but now we're very multicultural. Uh, and we have some of the world's largest uranium mines and thorium mines, and yet we don't have any nuclear power. As a nation, we do really take uh, the challenges of global warming and climate change seriously. And the federal government has actually imposed a carbon tax to tackle this, uh, and also supports uh, renewable energy such as solar and wind. However, um, there are no plans to introduce nuclear power uh, for carbon neutral base load gener uh, power generation. And also, in people's minds in Australia, um, the memory of Chernobyl and Fukushima persists. And on the other hand, reactor te technology is also improving at the same time, which they're not necessarily aware of. So the question is then whether the TMSR MSR, uh, technology would provide the magic bullet uh, to answer these uh, questions of energy security, energy sustainability, and perhaps give us the answer to climate change as well. Because this question is so important, it may, actually is very deeply felt that I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference, uh, Andreas Norlin, um, Synap, um, Professor Zhu Hongji, uh, for inviting me to this conference so that we could all come together and discuss these questions and answer um, and provide some answers perhaps. First, because I can see there's so many reactor people here um, and you will all like to talk about reactor theory, I'm going to have a little bit of an introduction to our own research reactor called the OPAL reactor. Uh, OPAL stands for Open Pool Australian Light Water Reactor and it was commissioned back in 2007. And um, just as a bit, of a bit of a trivia, Opal was a type of Australian gemstone. That's why we picked such a strange name. And then after that, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the thermohydraulic analysis we've been doing for Opal, uh, because I'm uh, trained as a mechanical engineer and I love talking about thermohydraulics. And then uh, further on, we're just going to talk a little bit about the, some of the research I've been doing in terms of dynamic meshing uh, and the applicability of that possibly to uh, various um, simulations of the molten salt reactor. So the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, uh, it's Australia's sole national nuclear laboratory. It's based in Sydney and it's 40 kilometres southwest from the Sydney centre. Uh, with a staff of about 1,200 people, we have people dedicated to a diverse range of research, including uh, neutron science, which is being done in the Bragg Institute. Uh, we do also do materials research. I think we do, uh, generate, we do a combination of generation for reactor support work as well as uh, fusion reactor support work in the Institute of Materials Engineering. We also have a, um, a technology called synthetic rock technology, or in short, SYNROC which is a kind of um, vitrification, but not vitrification for uh, waste repository solutions. And we also have activities in uh, non-proliferation research, so detection of fissile material, as well as analysis. Um, and also uh, we've got only recently acquired the Australian Synchrotron, which is located in Melbourne. So this is the picture of the site. Um, and it's not quite as large as some of the other labs say, around the world, but it's actually fairly compact and very productive. So this is a zeroing in on um, the research, uh, the reactor areas. In red here, this old decommission, not fully decommissioned, but this de decommissioned reactor is an old uh, Dido class reactor that we uh, got from the British. And it's one of four in the world. They're all decommissioned now, it's 10 megawatts, it's um, heavy water cooled, and um, so that was that served us very well for a long time, 40 years plus. And now here we've got the new uh, reactor facility. 
This kind of upside down tin looking thing is an aircraft barrier, so in case uh, there's any kind of terrorist trying to attack it. But this is the main reactor building. And the neutron guide hall here is where they do all the neutron science. Also, you can see here our backup diesel generators. You can see everything is in threes because we love triplication or redundancies. And you have the cooling towers here. Okay, so that's the picture of leading up to the reactor. We see this internal, that's, yeah, that's the open pool reactor here itself. The cores within this region, here are three pumps, at which time uh, during normal, nominal operation, two are at work and one is on standby, and that's the neutron guide hall. If we were on uh, 13 meters above um, ground level, uh, looking down from the open pool, this is the picture that you would see. So you would see that the nice Cherenkov glow, the uh, core here, compact core. This measures about um, yeah, 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters. And then around this, this whole, uh, the core is a heavy water reflector vessel. And the idea, of course, is that the neutrons coming out are moderated, and then they can become useful in those regions for uh, silicon uh, irradiation facilities here. And we supply um, some uh, J Japanese and Chinese companies. Um, the Chinese companies asked for about five times what we could supply, so we should have really built this thing a little bit bigger. Um, we also do uh, molybdenum isotope uh, production, so for medical purposes here. And we also have a lot of facilities for um, short kind of uh, pneumatically fed irradiation facilities where we can test small samples. This shadow here is the primary cooling pipe, uh, system pipe, and this shadow here is actually a cold neutron source. Okay, so a cutaway drawing here, we've got the open pool. We have about 10 meters of water between there and the core, and the reason for that is so that the boiling temperature is restored to about 120 degrees, give us a bit of margin. Um, around the core itself is the heavy water reflector vessel, and you can see all the penetrations of all the different facilities for irradiation. Uh, we also have a service pool, which is joined to the main pool by a canal, and this is so that we could uh, remove vent fuel and uh, place them in a way that uh, is safe. Yeah, so, and also you can see that there's a stainless steel construction, it's got a heavy inventory of, like a large inventory of cooling water, so that in any event of, say, um, loss of electrical power, loss of heat sink, we have a, a huge body of water to take away the decay heat. I just want to pay a little bit of t attention to the primary cooling system, because when we went forward to build this new reactor, we understood that there was a heavy emphasis from the population that it should be safe. And so, I'd just like to highlight some of the, um, the qualities of this new reactor and how we've gone about to, dis um, to ask for a fairly safe design. So we have two individual feed pipes for the um, primary, primary coolant, which is light water. Uh, as you can see, uh, not shown here, but the, the water travels up and then down because we want a siphon breakage. Uh, we have some flat valves here, which the water feeds into a plenum, on top of which is your heavy water reflector vessel. And then that is the uh, primary coolant pipe that takes the water, the hot water away from the core. So during operation, you have a continuous supply of water going down and then coming up through the core and up and outwards. So it's an um, uh, upward, upward flow. And the reason why we do this is that during shutdown, I mean, when the pumps are shut down, uh, the positive pressure, which is fed through these PCS pipes, that the positive pressure goes down and these flat valves open. And what happens is that it, and uh, what we have is the natural uh, convection cooling taking place, where water is taken from the larger pool itself and natural circulation uh, is, is, comes into being. But of course, during uh, normal operation with with positive pressure from the pump, the primary coolant is taken away uh, along this primary system, primary coolant system pipe. Uh, layout of the, all the piping work. The cold pipe going in, splits into two separate pipes, gets fed into the core, 
and then you have one primary cooling system pipe coming out into the uh, decay tank. So it's a labyrinth. The idea is so that um, you know this is how we overcome the nitrogen 16 uh, problem. And then the water is taken out, goes back into the uh, three heat. I mean the heat exchangers, and these are the three pumps of which two are actually operating at any one time. And of course, around all this, we put uh, lots of concrete, like so. And here you can see the details of the um, the hot cells as well. So the medical isotopes which we produce um, are transported underwater into the service pool, and then there's an elevator in which we can take those samples into the hot cells and then manipulate them. Okay, so a little bit more detail with the compact core. It's quite straightforward. I mean, this kind of design, MTR reactor design, is quite straightforward, and it works, it's reliable, uh, it's neutronically predictable, so this is what we went with. Uh, 16 fuel assemblies, they're about 7 by 7 centimetres uh, in cross-section, um, 21 fuel plates, um, and also we've got uh, half EM con control rods here and here. And, uh, you know, in the last five years of operation, we've accumulated a lot of operational experience, uh, characterizing its vibration characteristics. So we're quite um, advanced in our knowledge of the behavior of this type of reactor. And so I come from uh, a division called nuclear operations and the subsection of nuclear operations is called uh, nuclear analysis section. So of a staff of a hundred, about a hundred in our, in our division, uh, the nuclear analysis section is quite small, it's only 12, but uh, are composing of about eight neutronics people and four thermohydraulics people. It used to be that there was a team of 20 thermohydraulic people, but that was back in the day when you had to do a lot of experiments and you needed a lot of support stuff. In terms of the codes that we use for a neutronics calculation, we use MCMP. Uh, we use Parrot for um, coupled thermohydraulic and neutronics calculation. And we've also got an in-house code called OZ, which is a neutron diffusion code. In terms of thermohydraulics for our 1D systems code, we use RELAP and we have an association with uh, CEA of France. So they've supplied us with Qatar as well. And in terms of 3D uh, CFD analysis, we use CFX, Fluent, and we also have our own in-house CFD code, which is written in Fortran 95. So now I'm just going to talk a little bit about the thermohydraulics work that we do. So being thermohydraulics, simple and a simple statement is that we, we are interested in the removal of heat, whereas in Trix people are uh, interested in how much power is being generated and the heat amount of heat generated. So what you see here is one of those cans that go into the pneumatic facilities that I showed you earlier. And the assembly of this can, you've basically got your main can body, you've got an, another aluminium piece, which is just as a kind of filler. And then we have a, a titanium inner can for the, possibly the high temperatures that, that might be reached inside. And then just a little bit of aluminium buffer and then the cap. So our bread and my bread and butter work is say doing some kind of uh, heat transfer, transfer analysis for this can. Like uh, so, for example, I'd be asked to generate a model for the can. So this is all kind of uh, finite volume stuff. We generate all the volumes with all the details inside of the various parts of the assembly, and then we do some calculations. So we we do a CFD calculation with the appropriate mass flow uh, with nitrogen and then uh, inputting the power density that we'd expect in the cans as well as the uh, sample itself. So I'm not going to go into all the finer details because I know not all of you are CFD people and might not necessarily be interested, but I'd love to talk to you about, or you can just simply ask me at the end of this presentation about the details. Okay, so another example of um, uh, the CFD work that I do uh, is doing some kind of safety analysis. So for instance, uh, this here is a um, molybdenum irradiation rig. So in terms of scale, we're looking at about this cylinder about two inches, and these plates are about an inch wide. Quite, quite a thin, about two millimeters, and about 250 millimeters long. And inside, these are basically operating like kind of like mini fuel plates. 
because the uranium inside uh, undergoes fission and we process these plates in order to extract the molybdenum inside and of course molybdenum uh, further decays into technetium and that is the medical isotope that we use. So a, a, a strong mes message that we put out there is that we do supply Australia's medical isotope needs. Um, so the usual process is that we extract these uh, mini fuel plates or, or moly plates and we dissolve them in, in this uh, processing plant which is located inside a hot cell. Now the question is, say we can imagine an accident scenario in which um, some of the handling, there might be some accident handling and if, if some of these plates were to be dropped and then if they were to uh, awkwardly land somewhere without any kind of um, solid conduction path that comes out, I mean that's in contact between the plate and say the table, then we'd like to ask the question, okay, what kind of maximum temperatures could you be looking at? So to answer that, what we did was we kind of um, pictured a kind of like an extreme scenario in which the molybdenum plate is levitating somehow with no solid contact with anything and that there is no crosswind and that, um, yeah, so that all the heat removal is simply due to the um, radiative heat transfer from the target into the surrounding and then also uh, that all the uh, natural convection cooling is generated by the, um, the buoyancy as a result of the heat produced by the, by the plate itself. So a little bit of detail is that you've got, um, this is your model. Uh, we've discretized the uh, computational domain very finely. The reason why we did that was so that we could use a uh, rather sophisticated RANS uh, turbulence model, okay, uh, Omega SST turbulence model. The reason why we do that is so that we could uh, calculate for the lemma to turbulent flow transition appropriately. Uh, and you could see that around the, fuel, the plate itself is extremely fine to capture. Um, I know we've got a wall function, but we still kind of capture a lot of the, the flow details and try and get as much um, values around those regions as possible. Uh, this is the temperature um, contours you see around the plate as a result. And a case to note is the importance of having a correct emissivity value for your plate surface because you know, that uh, radiative heat transfers back back this greatly. And the way that we uh, measured the emissivity of the plate surface was by using a pyrometer. Uh, and so we have our numerical results and we have our PIV results as well to match local velocities or uh, values around the plate, as well as kind of looking at kind of the flow patterns that we look at, uh, that witness some of the flow patterns that's around the plate. And uh, we plot our results uh, by having temperature uh, as a function of the power being generated in the plate. And you can see that the results match up very nicely between the CFD model as well as experiments that we have. So in experiments, what we have is uh, actual two, actually two aluminium plates in which, into which is sandwiched um, heating wire to generate the power. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the, some of the research work that I've been doing in dynamic mesh modeling. Um, because our research reactor is water-cooled, uh, one of the Safety analysis that, I mean, safety criteria is that we have to avoid boiling and we're also very interested in boiling dynamics as well. Um, in terms of CFD technology, you might agree with me that for single phase flow, the technology is quite well developed. I mean, the understanding of turbulence models from RANS to LES to DNS modeling, it's, there are many, many papers published. And the, the, the cutting edge in research now is kind of going into multi-physics modeling or coupled physics modeling or uh, multi-phase multi flow simulations. And in terms of multi-phase flow simulations, there are also different schools as well, depending on the type of uh, resolution that you want to attain. So in the past, when we didn't have the kind of computing power to do um, to a high amount of detail, we used 
things like population balance models or uh, kind of like abstractions of averages of gas, gas, gaseous portions going through your volume. But what I'm more interested in is uh, looking at the problem explicitly, so actually tracking the interface of your, say, bubble, and then the evolution of that interface. So if we were to do this, we'd have to look at the finer points of this, these type of dynamics. So you, just looking at that, it's extremely beautiful. But what you have is that you have a very, very complex flow structure. So you have kind of like a domain discretization between the two phases, and each of the two phases, they have their own velocity fields. And so you have this covered kind of coupled gas liquid velocity field. You have deformable interfaces. Your surface tension effects, and thus, to do this type of simulation appropriately, you really need a high fidelity, uh, high resolution um, representation of your interface, so that, say, in isothermal flows, you would be preserving your mass on both sides of the interface. And then, if you were to, say, do um, some kind of boiling studies or mass transfer studies, uh, you would use that integration of your area surface uh, to calculate for mass transfer rates. So here we have a, an idealized representation of say something like a bubble and say we track the phase of gas as using the gas as a track phase indicated in red. This is what you see ideally with a very sharp interface and this is what you get uh, computationally if you were to represent the gaseous phase as some kind of fraction of your control volumes. So uh, I'm not sure if you know but in CFD a lot of the technology now is based around finite volume um, solutions. And what I mean by that is that in layman's terms, if say you want to simulate flow through a pipe, you would actually have a, uh, you would actually subdivide that pipe into small control volumes and you'll be calculating for the fluxes across those control volumes. So for single phase flow, that is fine. But if you have uh, multi-phase flows, then you would actually have the interfaces passing through um, those static uh, control volumes. So an easier way of uh, representing that is simply to track the amount of gas as a fraction of each control volume, and this is what you see here. However, if you don't represent the interface explicitly as a surface, then you might get things some, something like a smearing effect where you're not quite sure where the interface is exactly inside the control volume. And um, there's a little bit of a question, uh, and, and in a way, you're kind of losing information if you represent it simply like so. So the way that they handle that, though, is they um, reconstruct the interface by looking at the void fraction of your gas. So in the past, they would do something like using a slick method, where you re reconstruct the interface like so by comparing adjacent void fraction values or you do something like a piecewise linear interface reconstruction like so. And then the other approach to interface tracking is to explicitly track the interface. So you might have something like a marker and cell technique where it's basically you've got some massless particles and you'd have to join them somehow and that would represent your interface. But of course, you'd have to have fairly sophisticated kind of um, remeshing techniques to distribute the points on that interface very finely and so that you're conserving your volume, etc. And then there are more recent methods such as the level set method, which is to mathematically represent the interface as a PDE and you would solve that, uh, solve the distance function uh, to find it. Sorry, it's only five minutes, so I'm like, hurry up. So, so that's another method as well. Of course, sometimes you run into um, volume conservation uh, difficulties, and what you do is you put more massless particles in to conserve your mass. Anyway, so I, I stepped back from this whole problem. I thought, well, if I want to do boiling studies and you have changes in um, the size of your bubbles, etc., then, and, I, I want to, and if I want to do an explicit tracking of the interface, I would lose um, resolution of the surface detail if I actually have permanent markers. So you see something like this. If I were to track the interface as well, how would I represent it? I'm looking at the characteristics of the surface. Say, so, say I've got a curved surface like so, and I've got uh, points, whereas the intersection markers are. I could simply represent that as, um, as a plane cutting through 
um, those points. Of course, those of you in the audience are going to say straight away, well, what if it's not a plane? Well, you can use the least square uh, fitting method to find the plane. And we could represent really uh, any interface by a combination of all these uh, cut cells. So, you know, for those of you into tomography, you'd be familiar with this type of stuff. But for CFD techniques, what I thought I'd do is to work out all the combinations such as this, and then I could use all these combinations as a lookup table to regenerate the surface. And so I thought, okay, well, if I was to do this and say I've got a very small bubble uh, in uh, only a few control volumes, so say let's, there's the radius of this sphere is at 2h, where h is the uh, width of your control volume, uh, you'd get something kind of blocky like this, something like this, okay? But we, sim we can't simply just let the plane surfaces like this remain plane surfaces because if this bubble was to be in, uh, in a for uh, swirling vortex, the, the, the planes would twist and those points might not, would not necessarily cover a, a surface. So what you actually have to do is subdivide um, that square into triangles because, as you know, three points, you always um, get uh, this plane surface. And so I thought, well, if you've already got this kind of discretization, why don't you give the model a little bit more resolution by projecting the centroid towards where the surface ought to be? But then why stop there? You can subdivide the line on the cell face as well, and then you get something that's very, very close to a sphere only with a few control volumes. So you can see the comparison like that straight away. OK, so some of the features of this is that you've got uh, edge points, you have cell face conservation points, which is which uh, models the um, models the curvature as a trapezoid, and then finally you have a projected centroid in the center to give you a 3D a curve internal of the control volume. And uh, just quickly talking a little bit about how this um, interface tracking method works in terms of uh, advection. Uh, advection. So say if I have a, a sphere of gas and it's advecting through a um, body of water, the, what I'd do is I would calculate for the velocity field and then to call on the velocity field to uh, advect the points inside the cell itself. And I do this by using trilinear interpolation. So if, say I have to have an interface, I mean, I say I'm calculating for the new interface in some new time step, I first have to know what old interfaces are required to do so. And so what I do is I have this uh, interface. I remesh the area underneath so that it preserves the area. And then so that I basically do a re-smoothing. And this is the result. And I do this in such a way that it preserves the volume. OK, so I'm just running out of time, so I'm just going to go through all this. So here you basically see a very detailed representation of a sphere. And the colors correspond to the volumes underneath for each control volume. And then say we want to test something a little bit more exciting, like a donut or a torus. And you can see it generates lots of different combinations and patterns. And uh, it's quite nice to look at. And then I'm just going to like give you a quick uh, look at the advection. So I've got some simulations as well. So say this is a bubble. Uh, and it's calling a uh, velocity field, and it's rising, and um, yeah, and it's time to only moving as well. And you can see the beauty of the all the different evolutions of the interfaces. Thank you very much. So, if somebody wants to use your facility. For, for your irradiation? Oh, is yeah. it possible? We'd love to do that. Uh, I, I'm very, very happy to be here, as I said. Uh, I think, and we'd love to do some support work for the TM TMSR. Uh, what I didn't show you in the uh, diagram of the Opal reactor is that we have room for a facility to do, um, say, neutron flux, uh, irradiation of uh, fly samples, things like that. So, yeah, if you're interested, please come contact me. 
clearly have a lot of beam ports to get neutrons out. Do you have beam ports in which you can get protons in? We haven't got plans for an accelerator pumping protons, in, uh, protons into our core yet, no. How much was the construction cost of this OPAL facility? How much for the construction, construction. Of reactor? Yeah, reactor. I think the initial uh, estimate was about 330 million Australian dollars, and then, yeah, something around that, those lines. I can get you the figure. Okay, thank you.